Hi, everybody. Uh, I hope uh, uh, you enjoyed the conversation that I had with Matt today. We, we covered a, a wide range of categories, including the business that I founded, MDBI and Concierge Medicine, as well as the state of medicine today, my business in dermatology. It was a far reaching discussion, and I think uh, you'll enjoy listening. All right, welcome back, everybody. This is Matt Rosenthal. You're watching Digging In, and today I've got an amazing guest. Uh, I'm really excited because I actually used the service that that he uh, that he pioneered, and I highly recommend after you listen to this, considering using the type of service that he's going to tell you about. Uh, he's a medical doctor. Okay, this is Dr. Robert Colton. He's a medical doctor. What I find most interesting and most intriguing is, to me, he's a creator. He's created businesses because there's there's he has seen the need he has seen where being a doctor but going the extra step going further and seeing how you can really deliver service in an unbelievable way that's what he created and so i want to welcome actually one more thing he created another product or another practice which we'll talk about called clearly derm and it's a whole other part of his life that happened after he i guess exited the first part of his his uh business career so dr colton welcome to the show it's really an Thank honor you. to have you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we talked, I want to jump right into it. We, anybody who looks you up on the internet is going to find out, they're going to see who you are today. They're going to see that you created this amazing practice, that you have a new amazing practice. And I don't want to go there yet. I want you, before we get into that, I want you to take me back. Tell me before you went to medical school, you know, what was it that, that brought you there? What was your childhood like? What's, how did that all come together? Yeah, so basically, uh, so I grew up in North Jersey, West Orange. Um, I was always a good student and uh, good at math and science, particularly. Uh, and uh, I attended the University of Pennsylvania, uh, but I actually started in the Wharton School of Business. But, you know, it was the late 60s, early 70s, and we were in a time of, you know, we're going to change the world and make the world, you know, do something positive and leave the world better than where we came in. So with that kind of attitude, being in business school and you're in your early, your late teens, early twenties, I, I really had the, um, uh, I, I felt like just being a businessman, going to Wall Street or whatever, really wasn't going to be a fulfilling career. And with with a background in science and math and uh, a talent in that area, you know, I decided to go to medical school and thought that I could, you know, that, that, that I could be a good doctor, that I could learn, you know, learn everything necessary, that, you know, my natural skill set fit well with, with the practice. And I was all, always a, very much of a outgoing people person. I love people schmoozing, talking, hanging out, you know, was that type of personality. And I figured that worked perfectly with being a clinical doctor. I was right about that. So I we attended medical school with my, I got married early. We went to medical school together, my wife and I. She's a dermatologist. Our oldest daughter, who's a physician, graduate, uh, was born the day we graduated medical school on June 4th, 1978. That was our, that, that was a very big day. And um, I, I, I decided to become a, uh, Originally, I was going to become a neurologist, but you know, at that time, the really the therapy, the, the, you know, we were good at making diagnoses, but there were really limited amount or no therapy, so it was kind of frustrating. You know, you told people what was wrong. You have multiple sclerosis. You have this disease or that. You had a stroke, whatever, but there really was nothing you could do. So, you know, I really wanted to do something uh, where you know, it, it, where where. I had a different group of people where the therapeutics would make a real difference. So I went into primary care and I also did a fellowship in nephrology, which is diseases of the kidney, dialysis and so forth. We moved to Boca in 1984 and um, I was happened to join a practice with another nephrologist, but he did mostly primary care. So I evolved really to a predominantly primary care practice, which Frankly, I enjoyed more than the, than the nephrology practice. Again, 
you got to take care of people of different backgrounds, young, old, good mix. You know, um, it was really rewarding and, um, you know, I enjoyed it very much. But, you know, when I first started in practice, <coughs> my then partner, his name was Robert Sonneborn, uh, told me the way you build a practice, you become successful and you do well in medicine is if you take really good care of patients, you call them back, you call their families when they're in the hospital and everything else will flow from there. And that kind of worked in the 1980s, but as medicine evolved, um, reimbursements for, went down and the insurance companies got way pickier and it really became much harder to run a practice. And that paradigm that I just described really didn't work from a business standpoint. And it was really hard. If you were what I'll call an honest doctor, you just saw people and took care of them, did an EKG here and there in the office, but didn't try to bring all these other services in your office, that it was really hard to survive in practice. What doctors found out, at least in primary care, in fee for service, where they paid for each thing that you did, that the way to survive and do well was to bring a lab in and an ultrasound machine in and all kinds of gimmicks and gadgets. No, real, they were, they were, they were things that were needed, but you, you used to send people out for them and you could do them in the office. You know, I never liked it because um, I always felt that, you know, that, that someone could do the ultrasound better than I could and that whether I ran the lab on my machines or what sent them out to Quest or LabCorp, it didn't matter. There was no advantage. It was just a lot of extra work I had to do. So what happened, I mean, I, I tried to... Um, uh, you know, I tried to adapt to the change. I would say, you know, from an income standpoint, my income was highest, like three years into my practice. And then it just kept going down because of, of the medical industry. Now, a lot of doctors adapted. Like I said, they would do tests in their office. Some of them went into these managed care arrangements with HMOs, and they were able to save money and pocket money. And, you know, so there were success, a lot of successful doctors. Don't get me wrong on the specialists all did very well, but I, I tried to form, I formed a multi-specialty group that really didn't work out. I had a little smaller group, a bigger group. And, you know, at some point I realized, I said, you know, that model of where you, you, you know, see people, you take care of them, you build their insurance company, where you had to see 40 to 50 patients a day, 50 patients a day, just crank up the volume in order to meet the overhead and so forth. So people would say to me, you know, Rob, I love you. You're a great doctor. We love coming to see you, but we can't get through on the phone. You know, the appointments are months away. You're always behind, you know, um, and I explained, you know, what, what, what kind of stuck with insurance reimbursements. And then I actually spoke to a doctor in California and, <clears throat> and read an article actually about a doctor in the uh, in Portland, who had dropped all insurances, charging a flat fee per year, and I read it, it was in the it was in USA Today, I remember. And I read the article, and then I went out, took my golden retriever for a walk, you know. And as I'm walking, I go, that's it. That you know, it just sort of just dawned on me all of a sudden that what I had to do was stop with all the insurance nonsense. Um, that. If I, that, that if I charged a fee and could re reduce the size of my practice, I could be more available, more accessible, be on time, um, spend more time with the patients. And that it was really, and, and I said to myself, you know, I bet you people will, you know, pay more money for that service. So when I, I never believed that you have to keep things secret, you know, like people say, oh, I have a business idea. I'm not going to tell people. You know, most people don't act on anything. They, they talk, but they don't so act. So true. Yeah. yeah. So, so I remember I had a partner, Dr. Kamenetsky, and I presented him the idea. He loved the idea. He said, let's do it, but don't tell anybody. Well, now I'm going to tell everybody. I don't care. And when I would talk to the doctors and they would say, oh, that's never going to work. People don't even want to pay their $20 copay. You know, they, they're complaining about this or complaining about that. I said, no, people will appreciate we are not a commodity, a doctor. 
a good doctor is worth more than a not good. A doctor spends more time with you is better than a doctor who rushes you through. An honest doctor is better dishonest, a well-trained, but you know, that I said, you know, I think I have the reputation and I've spent all this time developing these relationships that I take great care of people that they will pay. So, so at that point I said, well, there also has to be, um, I really don't want to drop out of, out of the insurance plans. So, so we, what we did is we came out with a model where we were able to stay, particularly on Medicare, where basically we um, charged people for a annual physical examination, like people would go to New York for these executive physicals. We charge them, those executive physicals leads at the time weren't covered by Medicare. So we, we charged them for that physical essentially, but we said, but we're going to reduce our practice size and we're going to be, um, um, we're going to reduce our practice size and by virtue of a smaller practice, we'll be more available and accessible. I mean, let's just leave that to say, so, so what happened was I, I was so confident, you know, you know, how sometimes in life you're so confident. I was so confident. You knew. I talked to patients and they liked it. I, had a little wine and cheese party in our waiting room. I picked out the patients that I thought would want to do it. I went through their charts, figuring, you know, you figure, can they afford it? Where do they live? Do they, you know, they come see me a lot. Do I have a good relationship? And, you know, before I knew, I, I really was highly confident that, that it would work. So confident that I said, you know, not only am I going to do it for myself, but I think we could start a business and really help doctors around the country do this. I thought of that all of this, even before, we opened. It was like, we're going to do all of this without, you know, we never had, we didn't have a nickel of revenue at the point. Of course, we hadn't started. So Can I the interrupt other... you before you go yeah. any further? Because you, I, I want to just, okay. so I'm, about hearing, the I'm yeah. hearing you care about people for sure. I'm hearing that you have a lot of ideas, but I'm also hearing uh, here and there along the way, you, you, you keep having these business ideas that keep popping into your head. Were you around an entrepreneurial um, family or, or like when you were growing up, like where do you get the entrepreneurial side to you? Well, I think that, you know, my dad was, had a small business and he was successful and he always pushed business. In fact, I remember when I was little and I tr tried out for the baseball team, Little League, and I didn't make the team. Back then, kids didn't make the team. You know, now everybody makes the team, right? I didn't make the team. I didn't get a trophy because I didn't make the team. And I came home crying and he said, oh. Jewish kid, they're never going to play professional baseball and you're smarter than the rest of them. They're probably going to work for you one day. You know, that was his comment. So he liked business and I liked business, but I think, I think it was also out of the reality that, you know, the old, the old term, you know, work smarter, not harder. You know, Absolutely. I, I truly came into the practice just wanting to be a good doctor when I came in 1984 and, you know, things were good. And it was easy to submit a, a, a bill and, you know, you got paid well and I was, ha I was happy. It was out of really out of necessity that as I saw things changing and how, you know, doctors were almost being, you know, at least primary care doctors who were being driven out of their practices and quitting and moving to different venues and going to work for the VA or whatever, that it was out of necessity that I decided to, um, that I became entrepreneurial, I have to say. And I said, you know, there's gotta be a better way. And what people were doing were the things I was talking about. They were, they were bringing services into their offices to try to make more money or seeing more patients, which was really antithetical to good care. It's like- Yeah, they were creating multiple streams care. of revenue, trying to get more, more money from each person, but rather than thinking outside the box, right. how to deliver a better service and get stickier customers, people that really are loyal to you and then right. replicate that. Right. I mean, all the things doctors did in their office didn't do anything to help you, the patient, right? You yeah. still had a five minute office visit. You still were rushing in and out. You're still waiting. You still had to wait a month, a month to see the doctor. If you called for an, an acute problem, you couldn't get in or you had to wait two hours and, they, and you, you were told to be appreciative that the doctor actually was going to see you. I mean, it was crazy. And I, but yet, you know, you could do the test in your office. The patient doesn't care whether you right. run the blood in your office or you send it out. I mean, that's my example. In fact, things like ultrasounds and echocardiograms, they probably did them better at, at, the, at the hospital or done by a cardiologist and so forth. So, so, so real, I would say I became entrepreneurial out of necessity, although, you know, I was always a creative guy and I 
my partner who I ultimately broke up with, you know, he was like, well, we're not, you know, we're not doing well business wise because, you know, we have to work and we have to work some more and then we have to work some more and we have to cut our overhead. And I'm like, no, no, we have to find a different way to do it. The model is not working. We have to create a new model. We have to stand back and say, hey, there's got to be a different way. And then for a while, I thought of it and when I came up with that idea, we're going to build this concierge medicine um, um, practice, then um, I knew I knew immediately that that was going to be the model that was going to work. And the doctors that I worked with before who told me this isn't going to work and patients won't do it, you know, many of them have since done it, you know, including the doctors I worked with. Because you, you proved it. So, so you said before that, and this is where I stopped you, you said that you had the idea and you also had the idea at the same time that it could it could scale. Right. I could, yeah, I want to say the really interesting thing happened. So I start this practice and the exciting part, I wasn't a hundred percent sure, you know, I wasn't sure because I hadn't. So we sent we sent out these, you know, they had to fill out this form and went back to a post office box in the first few days. I had like two or three responses. I wasn't, oh, I said, oh my God. And then like on the fourth day, we had 150 responses and oh, the wow. mailbox was overflowing. So, so I knew, you know, right away that I was going to get to my 600 and I got to my 600 number probably in, I don't know, a month. I mean, so what happened, and this is, this is the fun part of it is we started this business and I was smart enough also to bring in some business people early saying, listen, I'm going to be the doctor. I can't run the business and be the doctor. So I have to bring in business people who, who have experience. That, that right there is so important that you knew Absolutely. that and you had the self-awareness. So many people, their ego gets in the way and they have to be everything. Absolutely. You were, that's a brilliant move. And I also called it a name. So it was MD, we, we came up with this great name, MDVIP. I always laugh at doctors that name something after themselves. I'm like, that's the dumbest thing, you know, the, I'm not gonna call it the Colton Institute because now it's got my brand, my name, everybody wants me. I want it to be like the right. Mayo Clinic, right? right. You know? They don't really, if you just go to the Mayo Clinic, you don't care what you see. With MDVIP, the idea was we'll become a brand that people equate with, with concierge and quality. What happened was the doctors around the country found out about this because we got all kinds of press, you know, two-tiered care, blah, blah, blah. A lot, some of, most of it was probably negative, but the word got out. And what I found out was the, the country was full of doctors just like me who just wanted to be doctors. They just wanted to see patients, spend a lot of time with their patients, not get rushed, do the right thing, not have to run a complex business with 30 employees doing X, Y, Z that were unimportant. They just want to see the patients, take good care of them, send them home and get and make a nice living. So, so these doctors were in the same position I was. Their income was really, really suffering. I mean, some of, you know, honestly, some of them weren't, I mean, hard for the public to believe, but some of these wonderful doctors weren't were were make weren't even taking they were taking home you know around a hundred thousand dollars a year maybe even less sometimes I mean it was crazy they were all ready to quit again go work for some somebody where they would just get a nice salary and they were working hard going to the hospital and so forth so all the doctors lots of doctors who were just like me called me and called their company and said oh my god this is a model I love can I do this as well. So that's really was the, the, the that, that was how we, we really grew so fast. We came in and we helped them all over the country start these practices. Now people would say, well, why did they need you? Why didn't they do it on their own? Well, for the very reason that they're not business guys. They said, look, I don't wanna have to, you know, hire all the lawyers and make sure the legal way to do it and come up with the forms and the marketing and signing and collecting, you guys do that. And just just take a piece of the action and give me the most of the money and I'll just going to run my practice. So it was a model that appealed to doctors that didn't want to run a business. It's just one you know, of the doctors. And that's the kind of doctor, by the way, you want to go to. A hundred percent. A doctor that cares about you. You just about, reminded you know, me of something. Uh -huh. you know, I'm in the IT business, but I, when I at times go to these larger conventions or I go, I go to something where they're, I'm, I'm being exposed to a system that is a better way to do things. And everybody in the room is an owner, just like me. I know when I look around that room, that 99% of the people in that room are excited. They're motivated. They're going to go back to their offices around the country and do nothing with the information. And 
at one of them, I actually walked up to a speaker and I said, do you ever get feedback of how many people actually take your service and actually do something with it? And he goes, yeah, he goes, actually, I could speak in front of 300 people and maybe two or three will actually do something with the information I'm giving. So you're, what you're saying is very, very true. It's, it's people listen, but execution and being motivated to actually take action and be consistent and persistent with it is, is uncommon. So what you did is uncommon because, because you're uncommon. <laughs> right, right. I agree with you. I, I yeah. say that all the time. Yeah. Most people talk and, and you know, when they tell you, Oh, that was someone will say, Oh, that was my idea. Like, I mean, ideas are, you know, listen, I thought doing concierge medicine was a great idea that I yeah. had and building a business. That was my novel idea. I came up with it. But like you said, I acted upon it and worked hard and worked at night and took us a year and find all the right people and and you know my and had a lot of people laughing at me thinking I was crazy, but it didn't matter. Glad you said that. You also, I heard this before, and I don't want to interrupt you. You tuned out the naysayers. You actually pushed right through the naysayers because you knew what's the worst that could happen? You fail, okay, you go back to what you were doing. Right. I mean, I had one group of doctors that a couple of doctors came up to my partner and me in the hall and they said, this is terrible. You're doing it. It's unethical. It's illegal. You can't do this. It's terrible. Blah, blah, blah. And, um, and my partner, Bernie was like, Oh, after they left, he was, you know, shaken, you know, wow. And I started to laugh and I said, Bernie, they're just jealous and they're good doctors. And I guarantee give them a couple of years, those two guys, they're going to do the same thing because I, I know they're going to realize that this is the right move for them. And that's exactly what happened. So yes, the, uh, it's jealousy. The, you know, yeah, that's, it takes a lot to do this. What I didn't expect when I told you before was it would be such a success that it became so huge all over the country. I, I didn't expect, you know, how, how was I going to know that I was feeding into this monstrous demand? Now, the problem is, is that our, our, our healthcare system is broken, that, that you have to go to a doctor where you wait two or three hours, and the way they pay doctors makes no sense, and the HMO, there's so many um, flaws in our system that people want to, are willing to pay extra for this type of service. If the basic system was responsive to people's needs, then this wouldn't succeed. It's really people like you, right. you, say, you know, I can't stand, you know, I had a friend of mine who said he went to one doctor and he had a five dollar copay and he said he got a five dollar visit guy went in how you doing uh and he took asked him a few questions took his blood pressure and said you're fine he goes well are you gonna take my clothes off and listen to me you gonna check my <laughs> prostate you can check right. my blood right no no nothing now you don't need anything so i left he said i got a five dollar you know visit get what so, you pay for for the the so so that's why you know it, it worked the rest is history we did extraordinarily well one more um, question before you tell me this. Yeah. Is this great? It's relevant right here. Did you at that point as you were building, because you had the foresight to know that this, this might become something bigger and you were planning on that partially, did you put systems and processes in place that would allow you to scale this like from the beginning? Yeah, a hundred percent. I had, we had a business people, we had contracts, lawyers, we spent quite a bit of money up front to make sure that we would be able to scale this. Absolutely. It wasn't like, oh my God, people are calling us. We don't know what to do. We had an infrastructure with the salesperson, you know, and uh, uh, operations people right from the get go. And I think the people that were my executives were, you know, were highly, highly skilled guys and, uh, and women. And so, so I had a great, you know, management team from the get go. So as you were, you're about to tell me as you were built, you were about to, this thing was about to take off. You basically had it boxed in a way where it was a package. So you could just drop that process into office after office after office. And, and that's where I want you to pick up because I think that's what you're about to tell me. So you packaged it in a way knowing that you might scale this out. And so it was, it was packaged where you could just drop this in on top of somebody's office basically and say, here's your process. Here's your systems. Now, now just follow the rules we've set out, follow the system. Correct. Correct. Exactly. We, what we did was exactly that. First of all, there was a legal issue of making sure to do it. So you weren't violating, you know, insurance law, Medicare law. Then it was really recruiting um, 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 patients going through and getting them to join, explaining what was going on. And it was, we, we gave them an electronic health record. And we also 
sort of train them, the doctors on what was expected them to do. So yes, we had a system to put together and, you know, and we explained to them, look, if you think this was one or I think, if you think that this is going to be a vacation for you, like, oh, I want to do this so I can play more golf. It's not, you're just trading, you know, spending five minutes with a person to spending half an hour, an hour with somebody, but you're still going to work a lot of hours. It's still going to be a lot of work. It's going to be much more enjoyable, rewarding, less stressful and so forth. But if you're the type of doctor that just wants to, like I said, you know, take the afternoon off or whatever, it's not going to work because the patients expect you to call them, be there, call them back. So, you know, they're paying you extra money. So they expect the higher level of service and the, uh, you know, that, that, so we did a lot for these doctors and a lot of them didn't really know how to sell this to their patients. I mean, the last thing that, this is funny, the last thing pa patients want to hear, patients want to hear it's always about them. We would tell, teach them, teach the patient you're doing this for them. So they have more of you that you're available. So if they're sick, they can come right over. You're doing it so that they can have better care, not because the system is broken and they're not, you're not making money and you can't make the payment on your Mercedes or whatever. Don't go there. They don't care about that and they shouldn't care about that. They care about themselves. They want to pay, they're going to pay money for if there's value in it, not because you want them to. You know, you have to do this because I can't afford or otherwise I'm closing my practice. No, you're doing it to help them. So, so we, we did a lot of teaching, a lot of doctors who really didn't understand that concept. Yeah. How did you maintain quality control where if you're putting your, this brand is, is branded a certain way and then somebody's not meeting standards? Yeah, I mean, the people weren't meeting standards. Some of them dropped out. Or we kicked them out. Um, How did you know, though? How did you know that was that was? Yeah, well, it was hard, hard. It was hard because we had them all over the place. The doctors, a lot of it was picking the right doctors coming in. It was about picking the right people. So you knew if you pick certain doctors that they already they were already had great reputations and did the right thing and you know had no blemishes on their uh, record and their patients. We 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 would. Um, survey their patients and, uh, uh, you know, find out how much they appreciate a doctor. So that, you got to understand not every doctor could do this because the, in order to do this, yes, the patients had to be a little wealthier, but the patients had to love their doctor and appreciate their doctor. I mean, we had one doctor that we wanted to bring in and we would call the patients. They go, pay $1,500. I mean, he guy should pay me. I only go to him because he's on my plan. He's terrible. He's awful. He's miserable. So what happened is we picked out the better doctors to begin with. But yeah, you say a, better, you know, it, this isn't tactically better. This is um, the belief system. It's their energy. It's, it's the way they talk to people. And this is more correct, about correct. personality and behavior. Correct. Which is so much of, of, of healthcare. Now, could yeah. we monitor everything they do? Of course not. You know, we, we couldn't, but you know, we, we, you know, we pick people with the best training with a great pedigree with no blemishes on the record, you know, who were respected in the community. We did check their references. I mean, it was a lot of work that went into, you know, bringing them on board. And you never at this, at, now it's, it's, it's happening. It's growing. You didn't get pulled into operations. You were still able to do what you would enjoy doing. Well, what's interesting. I had my partner, Bernie, I could, I was having a lot of fun being the first concierge doctor to tell you the truth. I mean, it was great. I was a guy, I was the point guy, I went to the meetings with the doctors, you know, right. oh, Rob, you know, so I really didn't want to step back from my practice because I was having a, such a good time yeah. and enjoying it so much. So what happened is my partner though, I could see he didn't really enjoy the practice as much as I did. So, and he was a very detailed, organized guy, wrote, wrote beautifully, spoke well at meetings and so forth. So I convinced him to step back. I said, Bernie, why don't you become the medical director of the company and I'll just stay because I think you'll be happier doing that and helping with the operations and I'll just stay here and kind of be, you know, the marquee guy, you know, and that worked out better. I mean, although I did, you know, I did, what happened is I guess six or seven years into, I brought another doctor in to help me with my practice. And I, I you know, I'd go around the country and meet doctors. I did spend more time with the company not a, not a tremendous amount, but I did. And I needed somebody to help me, but, but I didn't leave my practice until we sold the company. All right. That's a perfect segue because I'm familiar with what you did. And it's pretty amazing that having just told the story you told where it ended up, how, right, how, right. how big did it get? And then what happened? 
what happened is it grew it grew like crazy and and we took in a an investment from the summit capital partner and a private you know the, they're a private equity group out of uh, uh, Boston and we took a smaller smallish investment from them and we were we probably really could have interestingly we probably we were doing so well on a cash flow basis we probably didn't need their money I guess I don't think we ever even spent it but it gave us credibility on the street you know oh they're you they're with Summit Capital they made it to be great and then one day um, we just get a call out of the blue from Procter and Gamble saying you know we're looking to expand and we have this new division in Procter and Gamble we're going to try to build billion dollar brands and we were interested in the concierge medicine space and you're the big player and so forth can we come down? In fact, they just called the company cold. And, and in my C, they said to Procter & Gamble, can I speak, can we speak with your CEO? I'm like, CEO thought it was a joke. Yeah, you know. Right, it's a great call. call. So then they said, well, can we send somebody down and just watch your operations? So they sent a couple of people down to just sit in our office, in the corporate office for a while, and for probably at a year. And then they came Wait, back. Wait, they stayed and- in your office for a year? They stayed in our corporate office and followed everybody around. We had nothing to hide. You know, so it looks like, oh, fine. we want to learn about this. Fine, learn about it. You know, of course, we were thinking maybe they'll want to make an investment. Then after a year, they came in and said, you know, we want to make a sizable investment in your company. And then they did that. They bought, I think, uh, probably uh, 30% of the company. And then the next year, they came in and said, you know, we want to buy the whole thing. <laughs> And the price was excellent, and we really didn't negotiate on the price. And at first, they were going to buy it, and we were going to have an earnout and this and right, that, right. fighting. And then finally, they said, "No, just we're just going to buy the whole thing." That was now, it. what? How many years after you started it did that happen? Um, that was, I think, they bought nine years. Okay. Nine I, years from when we started it to where they bought it. You did that, and I'm I'm taking some some notes as you're talking. You you did that, and, and what I'm hearing based on one principle: people treating people well, serving people, truly serving people, and doing the right thing. That's what I'm hearing. This whole story is it, it, absolutely. I'm so yeah, exactly. And I, you know, I give talks in entrepreneur groups at the at the FAU undergraduate school and other groups. And that's, I just gave one at my temple the other day, but, and that's what I said, you know, find a market need and that serves people and, and, and fill that void with whatever business you're creating that gives you the most, um, both financial and reward and personal reward for, for help, for helping out and helping the world and helping people. And that was what this yes. was all about. It yes. was really, I mean, we had doctors that came to us that I'd won my, my lawyer called me, said, my doctor wants to retire. He can't stand it anymore. And uh, he said, I told him about your practice. The guy called me, we met him and he was fantastic. I think we signed him up three weeks later. I mean, and he, and he extended his career for another five years in this model. He was just going to walk away because he was just so frustrated. I have so many anecdotal stories of doctors being happy, patients being happy, you know, doctors telling stories about how they had more time with patients and how they were able to help them make better diagnoses, you know, help them with their family issues, their personal issues. I mean, you know, it, it, so much of doctoring is good doctoring is about, you know, is about trust between the doctor and the patient and communication and being the captain of the ship. I mean, what happened was patients used to say to me, oh, if I have a problem, I want to go back to New York. I don't don't want want to go to New York doctor and this and that. And then as I built this model and people had so much faith in me, I mean, I had doctors from New York call me say, well, they patient saw me and I want to do this, but she said, you can't do anything until you call to Dr. Colton. So it kind of reversed because they had so much faith in what I had to say. Did you say that you went to business school earlier? I started, right. I started in Wharton Business School. So I had a good business education and I understood business. And I still understand business, but I switched from Wharton Business School to the regular school at Penn. And I I was a a major 
in biochemistry, but I also minored in economics. The so story that biochemist. The story that you just told, I this applies to any business. It doesn't matter what business you're in. You have an you had an idea. You 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 thought about it ahead of time to the point of what could happen, how to put systems processes in place, the right people, all of it. You knew there was going to be commitment discipline. You, you, it doesn't matter what business. Your story applies to anybody who's thinking of, of, of taking, a, maybe taking a risk, maybe trying something different, maybe going into starting a business. Your whole story, soup to nuts, is it doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter. And now, as far as the business you're in, I mean, obviously, most doctors don't think the way that you think because they're, they're more analytical and less of the sales, less of the marketing just the way the, their brains work, right? You, you are a unicorn and what you did is very uncommon, but that's, I think holds true for anybody in any business that goes beyond average. Does you just see right. things differently? Oh, thank you. I think I do. I mean, you know, they said people don't like to brag, but I really do think oh, right. I have that vision, right? You all do. I do think I see things with it. And I saw this way ahead of everybody else. And I saw that it was going to work. I had, I was convinced actually it was going to work and was willing yeah. to take risks. Now I laugh also, I, I, I gave a big talk with the, there's now, you know, 1400 MD VIP doctors. And I gave a talk to one of the big groups and said, well, my wife was a dermatologist and I figured if it fails, you know, dermatologists do very well and you know, she could support me. <laughs> and the, oh, everybody laughed. That, that got the biggest laugh. You had a plan B. Plan B was, <laughs> all right, Andy, you work and I'll do something else. But so, yeah, so I had some degree of security so yeah. that allowed me to take that huge risk. Um, but, but yes, I agree with you that I saw it and nobody else did. In fact, almost everybody thought it was a ridiculous idea. But I, I think I understand people and what people want. You know, I'm, I'm I'm toying around right now with a, 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 I'm actually an advisor. I'm on the board of a concierge oncology company, which we won't talk about. And I'm working with some people on a, a, a sort of, I'll call it a concierge model for um, uh, early, for memory disorder and for people, because the, the, the care that people are receiving, right now the MDVIP model works great. It doesn't work great for, older people with a lot of problems, particularly if they have memory problems. Those people need a whole host of care. Sure. Dietitians, physical therapists, psychiatrists, psychologists. It's, it's, a lot, it's a lot of effort goes into trying to prevent, prevent these people from getting worse and managing them. And they're all falling through the cracks. So if you can build some type of complete cohesive model that takes care of everything that they need, I, I think there would be a market for it. Now I'm 70 years no old. No question. But, no question, but no question. You know, I'm I'm never going to retire till essentially. I mean, stop doing these types of things till I die. So, so I'm working on that. But there's no question that that is a huge problem and getting bigger. And I know that the MDBIP model really doesn't work well for that. You need a different kind of model where you have a neurologist and a primary care doctor working together and a lot of ancillary people helping. It's helping such an idea. Families guy. communicating with the kids in New York. And, you know, yeah. so it's much more complicated, but Fantastic. I'm up for the challenge. So take me through. So you, so you sell the company, you're out. You're still involved, but you're, you're not MDBIP. You to something else after that. Correct. So after MDVIP, I, um, I, uh, um, you know, my story is, you know, I sold it and I said, well, you know, I'm comfortable now and I don't really need to work. And I've worked so hard all my life and I'm not even 60 years old and I'm going to retire and have a good time. So I retired and I like to play golf. So I played a lot of golf. And then when it rained one day, I said, oh, thank God it's raining. <laughs> you know, this, this is not for me, this golf yeah. every day, you know, I yeah. know intellectual you missed the adrenaline right so i talked to my wife who was a dermatologist who was going to sell her practice and i said you know i think we could let's start a, a larger dermatology practice and we'll have some fun with it and we're not exactly sure what we're going to do but we're going to try to set up a model where we're more available and accessible when people can get in on the same day and we'll be more uh we'll be more retail and more patient focused and you know we'll try to improve upon the models that are out there and, you know, so now we have six clinics, 11 dermatologists, nine physician assistant nurse practitioner, about 100 employees. 
wow. we're doing great. And, you know, because again, I think, um, again, the dermatologists were setting up practices kind of to, in a way that, that they liked, you know, doctors set up practices, doctors sometimes will succeed, set up an office that, that meets their own personal needs and maybe their employees needs and not really their patients needs. Things like when you call a doctor's office and they're at, you ever notice that you, doctor's office is the only place where you call, they have, they're out to lunch. They're at lunch. <laughs> That's true. At, who's at lunch? You right. call a retail store, they're at lunch. I mean, you call lawyers, you don't call anybody there at lunch, only doctors. And the patient has this vision of the doctor and staff sitting at, you know, over at Houston's or something, you know, that's not what happens. They're just trying to catch up and it gives the, the staff a chance to catch up and whatever. So we said, we're not going to have close for lunch. We're going to answer the phones better. We're going to try to get people in right away. So, so, so I took some of my what I learned from concierge medicine and applied it to dermatology. It's working out great. I don't spend a lot of time with it. You know, my daughter, one of my daughters, who's an MBA from Columbia, run, essentially runs the whole business now. And she's almost 40 and she's doing a marvelous job. So that the back business is on autopilot, but, but we're growing, we're having a good time and we attract like-minded dermatologists who want to take good care of people, just want to see patients, don't want to game the system, you know, it's, it's kind of a very similar model to what we did before. By the way, maybe one of the most brilliant things you've done is having your daughter, is, is, is cultivating your daughter to be able to run the whole empire. Right. Well, what <laughs> happened was we were having trouble with some of the operations and we yeah. brought in some operations people and they weren't doing great. Yeah. My daughter is a super operator organizer, was working yeah. for a big bank in New York and she called and said, you know, daddy, I think I could really help you. I, I watch what you're doing. I think I could help. Why don't I just come down, you know, a little bit and I'll see what I can do. And, and my partner was like, oh, you don't want to bring in your family and so forth. But after about a month, we said, now, Becky, you're doing such an awesome job. You need to move here, you know? So, so that's what she did. And she's terrific at and the, and the employees really respect her. She's, she's done the doctors, I mean, working with doctors is hard. Doctors have big egos, you know. And each doctor wants what they want, but she's managed to keep them happy and keep the patients happy. Yeah. So you've you've managed to to do it again on a smaller scale with your with your wife in the dermatology business. And that's still running. Your daughter's uh, running, running it, helping you run it. Right, right. What else are you doing? So now you have the other idea for the um what you mentioned earlier with maybe putting together a package or a yeah. system for people that are older with memory issues. Right. So that's enough. It keeps me busy. It keeps that's you busy. Right. And I also, I do play golf, you know, once or twice a week and okay. I work out with a trainer, you know, three times a week. And I'm, in, I'm on the board of uh, a couple of few charities. In fact, after I meet with you, I um, have a Jewish national fund meeting. I'm on the board of the uh, medical school at FAU. And um, I'm involved with my temple. And uh, um, I'm also on the board of a company that's involved in uh, you know, slowing aging and reversing aging. It's called the Great Age Reboot. The guy who started it, the, the Dr. Michael Roizen from the Cleveland Clinic. So I, I, I'm, involved, I'm on his medical board and on his big board. So I'm, you know, I mean, there's a tons of things that keep me busy. I, I have, you know, you get this phone and, you know, every day is chock full of, uh, yeah. of, um, of agenda items. And, you know, people call me for advice. Yeah, you know, my patients 10 years later, I mean, my former patients still text me, call me. Well, I know you haven't been my doctor for 10 years. Can I ask you a question? What do you think I should do with this and that? Someone asked me today, about, you know, should they get the fourth COVID shot? They had COVID and their husband had a lymphoma. And they, I mean, there, there, there is a, you know, so I'm doing that. I mean, I keep very busy. As we wind this down, I, I, I told you my story earlier before we recorded it, but I want to just, I want to say it again, the much shorter version, because now having heard what you did and how you created it, I'm able to look back on my own experience so I had said to you earlier, but I, so I moved to Florida three years ago, came here. The whole situation with waiting for, in, in waiting rooms was no good. Somebody turned me on to this idea of a concierge doctor. I'd never heard of it before. Google found somebody local. And what I can share is just a different angle on, on, on the whole thing. Um, I'm the CEO of a company. I own my own company and, and I'm, I'm very, very busy. 
I don't have time to sit and wait for things. So for me, that time when I'm not being productive, it really literally is money. So for me to, to invest um, the, small, the small annual fee to work with a concierge doctor, that pays me back 10 times over, maybe more. Every time I go to that office, I'm the only one there. I get phenomenal attention. I'm treated very well. It's very, very thorough. I've never felt in my entire life I've had this, this kind of uh, medical attention just in general, like the, the thoroughness of the reading labs and everything. It is well worth the money. And for anybody out there who even can re remotely find a way to do it, it seems expensive and it's all relative. Everybody's at different levels. But if you can find a way to do it, you get paid back with time and not only time, but it's what you said before, the trust and the confidence that the person that you're working with is taking their time to make sure that they're really paying attention to the details of you and your case and, um, and just your, 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 your body, you know, and that makes a difference. And I've experienced it and I didn't know if it was you that created it. And so uh, it's kind of cool for me to have this conversation okay. with you after the fact, because I can't imagine if this didn't exist. I mean, it's had such an impact on me personally. So it's, it's I, I, amazing. I hear, I agree with you hundred percent. I hear your story every day, all the time, all over the country. I go somewhere and someone says, that's Rob Colton. He introduced it. He found it MDVIP. They say, oh, I'm a patient. I yeah. love it. It's great. You're, you know, I call them right. You know, those types of things. Yeah. So I hear, I get positive feedback all the time from patients and from the doctors who join. So yeah, you know, it's been very, very rewarding for me. Again, when I first started, I was excited about it. Never thought that it would take on the the size and scope and influence in the country that it has. So I started out the show when I introduced you by mentioning that you were in, in healthcare. But what it really was is you're you're a creator. You're an idea person. You really are a creator. I'm listening to everything you're saying. It's like one thing after the other. Uh, it is a gift. I think everybody can tap into that gift, but you have it very much on the surface. You're a creator. And the message that you shared today to me was, I think anybody that listens to this can get 15 different things out of this conversation. Um, and I'm really appreciative that you came on and I know you have to go and your family's waiting for you, but I gotta go. this is valuable. This is going to help a lot of people. And it might not be tomorrow. It could be a year from now, but All right, this is going to help people. Okay, great. Thank you, Matt. And thank you for everything you've done. And my, the last thing I want to say, which I say at the end of every show is, and you did it. Be humble, hustle, and do the work. And that's what you've done. Okay. And that's how you reach your potential. And I feel like that's your story. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for coming on. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Okay.